Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to day seven of the L2 construction series. Again, I would like to thank all the audience uh, for joining this session, for taking the time off and uh, listen to our L2 construction series. And as uh, the day shows, this is a day seven, meaning to say that we have actually done uh, seven days consecutively. Every morning at 11 o'clock, uh, we try to bring you with up-to-date, very relevant topics relating to construction uh, matters. Now, today we have a special guest who is not only uh, to be interviewed, but he will be the main presenter for today's session. Uh, his name is Wong Chong Wei. The topic uh, for today is Good Practices in Construction Contractual Documents, What and How. Now, he will be sharing his, uh, from his very vast uh, experience as a contractor, as a lecturer, as a claim consultant now, in the preparation of um, uh, construction uh, documents, not only during the course of the works, but also for the purposes of pursuing claims at the later stage or when it arises. Now, I'm going to pass the mic to Wong Chong Wei, our special guest today. Uh, Chong Wei, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, okay, can you uh, move closer to the mic uh, so that uh, the audience uh, can hear you better? Right, can you hear me? Now, Maybe Chong Wei, can, uh, can you uh, perhaps give a, give a little bit of uh, introduction about yourself? Okay. Before you Hi. proceed with the presentation today. Yep, thank you, Wailun. Hi, everyone. Good morning and happy Sunday. My name is Wong Chong Wei. I'm a founder of WCW Consulting. Uh, I'm a chartered county surveyor and practicing adjudicator as well as mediator with over 20 years of experience in construction industry. So my current practice, as Wailun already mentioned, so uh, I'm currently focusing on the commercial and contract management, claims and dispute resolutions, and also conduct uh, quite frequent on the in-house and public training session for contractors, developer, and also uh, for also uh, part-time lecturer for the US degree students. So next. Next, please. Okay, right. Okay, based on my observation, which I find that there are some uh, good and poor practices of construction contract administration during post-contract stage. However, in view of our time constraint today, I have identified four common elements to share with you based on the, my uh, observation. So let me briefly, briefly bring you to. So the first one will be the commencement of work. I think usually quite common for the uh, employer or contractor issue letter of work intent in, due to sometimes due to the, the urgency of the work and to kickstart the preliminary preparation works. Of course, the good practice will always will issue the letter of award timely to the, the successful bidder. Next element will be verbal instruction. Of course, my observation also notice that quite the verbal instruction is still unavoidable, still happen uh, happening in the project side for the from, from consultants to the contractors or from contractors to the subcontractors. Of course, good practice will be it's good to formalize the verbal instruction in writing for either from the contractor to consultants or contractor to subcontractors. So the third element will be extension of time. So notice, as we know that actually for the entitlement of EOT under pen contract is a condition precedent. So the notice of delay is a, is a very important document to issue. Although my observation also notice that still many contractors or subcontractors not really issue notice of delay uh, timely, okay? So the fourth element with contractual claims. So being adjudicator or party representative for SIPA matters. So also notice that sometimes the parties or the, the, the approaching party to take SIPA action also, may find also notice insufficient documents or poor records. So the good practice will still, is good to keep the proper and contemporary records. Next slide, please. So now, we discuss a little, a little bit more uh, on this particular letter of intent versus the letter of award. So of course, as I mentioned just now, in construction industry, it's quite a common practice for employer to issue the LOA to the successful bidder. Generally, majority of the construction project are on the fast track mode, right? So hence, the employer will issue LOI to main call, main call will issue LOI to the subcontractor. 
So the parties will continue to negotiate the terms and conditions. So they then eventually will hopefully will be able to formalize the LOA. However, the objective of the LOI or the on the employer side or main contractor side basically is to kickstart the preliminary works, such as the to set up the site office, hoarding, or the subcontractor can start to prepare shop drawings. This particular exercise actually able to facilitate the main contractor planning as well as consultant design uh, coordination part. So which is quite understandable. However, provided that the LOA issue within a reasonable time for the successful bidder. By the way, thus the LOA is a valid contract, which we all know that actually is not really a valid contract. However, the con some of the contractors may carry out the work with at risk. So for the LOA part, let's say the, the LOA able to, I mean, it usually will take quite a long period for the for the employer side, I mean, contractor side to formalize LOA. So through my observation, basically, I, basically either both parties are never come to agreement on the terms and condition, or sometimes due to the, may due to the complexity of the project. Then what if the LOA, the contractor has received the LOA, Thereafter, how to deal with LOA? So you will sign and return, or the, the contractor will carry out the review before confirmation of the acceptance. So I always encourage contractor to review the terms and conditions, although a little bit quite time consuming. However, I find that it's a very good exercise. So therefore, by, by conducting the contract review exercise, actually is a reassessment uh, uh, process able to identify the potential risk and opportunity. They have to clarify in writing with the client, employer or consultant instead of rushing to sign and return. And I fully understand that the business deal is very important, especially recent years, right? So, and there are some circumstances you may hear from the employer saying that take it or leave it. You are not allowed to clarify any terms and conditions. So, Ultimately, also depends on the business decision. So my point here is at least to conduct the contract review exercise, which is part of risk assessment. Of course, if you die, die must secure that particular contract. Then after this particular exercise, we'll assist the, and ensure that the project team will be more alert and very practice the good contract administration approach to avoid the time and cost implication risks. Next, please. So this particular, this particular, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a typical construction project timeline show that when the project, the contract starts and end contract, right? So here also you notice some of the key clauses related to time and cost uh, elements and also the important certificate of practical conditions and certificate of making goods defects. Next, please. So when the when the project kickstart or during the course of the work, usually you may notice that sometimes consultant will visit the project site or the employer may want to change some of the finishes or because of the site constraint, then will require to facilitate any changes on the site. So during the site visit by the consultants or architect, so then together with the contractor, may from time to time may have some verbal instruction required or issued by the, uh, the consultants. Then, hence the consultant will already inform the contractor. I will, I will strongly advise the contractor to confirm the verbal instruction in writing. Since the pen contract of 2006 cross 2.2 also provided these particular provisions. However, I find that the subcontractor also, also can formalize the verbal instruction conveyed by main contractor for any changes for the, regarding the project or contract. So to avoid unnecessary uncuban when the VO work completed and especially when reach the VO claim stage, so tend to have some argument on the recognitions of the validity of the particular instruction. Next, please. So this particular clause 3.1 provisions, the priority of contract documents, which I find that another very important clause or provisions for the PEM contract. So it's a guide in the event, guide to the contractor or the contracting parties in the event any conflict or discrepancy arise between the documentation. So then therefore, 
the you will notice letter of award actually is higher priority than the remaining documents as com for pen contract 2006 or 2018 still remain unchanged as compared to the the previous version 1998 which letter of award is lower priority than the uh, article agreement or condition of contract so therefore i keep emphasizing the loa is a very very important documents so because it's the top priority compared to the remaining uh, contractual documents and also the you may notice 3.1 f other documents incorporated in the contract document unless expressly stated to be excluded in any of the contract document so here actually sometimes the consultant will compile those tender addendum tender clarifications and any mini submitting so during the tender stage to incorporate it under this particular 3.1 f next please Okay, so my observation actually is quite cha quite challenging for consultant to compile uh, the tender documents convert into contract document within the short period of time. So sometimes may take quite a long period of time. Especially sometimes you may find that when this dispute arise, the contract document is still not ready. However, sometimes maybe because of the complexity or because of the too many documents to compile. So I think PEM contract two thousand eighteen with the already with the new provisions which cross 3.3 right architect to provide one set of contract documents within 14 days upon contract award for contractor to review and signify it however i find this particular 14 days is quite challenging for the contractor consultants to really able to meet to meet this particular uh, requirements but positively it's a very good move so my point here is contractor to check carefully on the contract documents whether the details of document are consistent with the tender documents or any documents, especially contract drawings, before sign the contract documents. So some observation also noticed that some additional information was added in the contract drawings, which did not appear in the tender drawings. Sometimes maybe because of the error or whatever. So I think it's very, very uh, important to run through pages by pages or all the document or the contract document provided by the consultants then from there, before the contractor signify the contract documents. Next, please. All right. So, this and to me, this is another very very important uh, clause. Although uh, it's not the work program is not form power contract, right? So you notice that actually contractor has the obligations under the pen contract uh, required to submit the submit the work program to the architect within twenty one days, and also okay. required to incorporate those are important elements such as procurement activities, the on-site activities, manpower resources, and they on. So what is the purpose of this work program? This work program is a very important tool for the architect to refer and also assess in the event the contractor would like to claim time and cost implication. Next, please. All right. So in view of this MCO period, right, then, and this L2 series, also, you will notice that actually Hong Ki and uh, many speakers also focusing on EOT. So I, Hong Ki also I share quite a fair bit of checklist for EOT claims. Then here I just share with you about the procedure, because the uh, for uh, PEM contract actually provided two step procedure for EOT claim, which also applicable to loss and expense VO accordingly. Yes, notice of delay is a condition uh, precedent under clause twenty three point one. And you notice that starting of the any relevant delay event, the contractor shall within 28 days to notify the architect the intention to claim for the, uh, the additional time. So then followed by the application of EOT. So you notice you also hear from last week that Wylon also sharing that there is a court of appeal decision where notice of delay is a must for the entitlement of the EOT of, for the contractor. Therefore, notice of delay is still another very important uh, notice to be issued to the consultants. In practice, nowadays, seems more contractors or subcontractors there to issue notice of delay as compared to the past, due to not to jeopardize the business relationship. Maybe due to the last year federal court decision on the cubic drawing case, which the party who imposed LD no longer required to prove the actual damages as compared to the previous Selva Kuma case position. So pay more attention on the contract administration practice and procedure, especially pen contract provision. 
I find that PEM contract provision practice and procedure actually, although it's quite strict, as long as the contractors or subcontractor able to follow PEM contract practice and procedure, I, I find that the, the, the contracting party able to sustain for any bespoke contract or any form of contract because this particular form, this particular practice and procedure, to me, I find quite a good practice. Next, please. Okay, good records for contractual claims, VO, EOT, loss and expense, and final claim, and extra. So I'll share with you. Next, please. Right, so these are some of the, I find that some of the good contemporary records that the contractor uh, worth to invest resources to well keeping of all these records. Right, so the, the this, this will actually, when all these record correspondences, correspondent letters or notices were programmed, site diary, photograph, or the quality records measurement, or any other relevant supporting documents. So all these are very, very important for time and cost implication claims, right? So then if all these record well, well kept by the project team, this will also able to ease the project team when substantiating their respective contractual claims to, to the, the client, their clients or consultants, say eventually may not come when the, if it, the position come to really sour or not really able to resolve, then the, say you want to take CIPA action, actually you are already equipped with all these particular documents. However, I, I, I would like to stress here that not only those EOT loss and expense or VO claims, the final claim also is another very important claim for contractor and subcontractor. I will, I will encourage contractor team to consider the mindset of begin with the end in mind. So to plan and get ready the process for compilation of the relevant documents to support the final claim during the construction complete implementation stage, especially on the quantity mentioned take times, right? And we all record, start early. So instead of only start to compile the relevant documents for final claim towards the end of the completion stage, sometimes may be a little bit too late. Why? Because the concern is due to the nature of the construction project life cycle, some of the project team members or project consultants may transfer to other projects or resign. Hence, it's not easy for the contractor QS team to compile and seek clarification on that particular documents. This may be the reason prolonged the submissions of proper final claim. As you know that the PEM contract also with a specific timeline for the main contractor and subcontractor to comply upon the CPC issue. Next, please. So I share a little bit on key takeaways. Next, please. So as usual, for construction contracts or contract administration, records, record, records is a very famous and common three important quotes. So contract claim, so therefore, we must have a written contract, especially now SIPA enforced, right, since 2014. Firstly, we must have a written contract and we must claim, not only progress claim, we all the cost and time claim also need to submit. Sometimes the sometime some of the contractor may not claim the VO until finalize the VO with the consultants. Then, but it's good, good practice that once the follow contract procedure to notify and the work, work done, carried out, and put up, submit the notice accordingly, and register in your progress claim. Then next one will be the work program. Work program, you ideally you will have the baseline work program and the impacted work program, and also as built program. This also will assist you to justify the, or your time implication. Then the last one will be the photo. So photo can tell thousand words, right? So able is contemporary record, especially for this particular photo will really assist you when come to the later stage of the any dispute arise or any variation claim. For example, when you want to justify one variation works, omission, addition, uh, in elements involved, you may able to uh, demonstrate the before and after the particular changes. So then, this exercise will prepare yourself with a better position and more bargaining power when negotiating contractual claim with your clients. So therefore, I find that to, to capitalize this particular MCO period and to review and check your contractual documents or records, followed by strengthening the doc documents if necessary, since MCO period also less disruption from the external parties. And this will well position yourself when the MCO period is over, then then you were able to prepare this particular uh, discussion with your clients. Or worst case scenario, to, to take SIPA action or legal actions 
then you are ready for the battle. So I meant both sides. Nowadays, not only claimant, the respondent side also must, must keep good records too for defense, their, their position. Hence, I always encourage the contractor to start commercial settlement discussion as a first option to avoid unnecessary cost and time. Due to my past experience being, a con being, being attached with the contracting companies, usually I seldom, seldom propose legal actions against the clients, which usually we settle commercially with, the, with proper contractual records. However, after exhausted all the options available, then only consider dispute resolution methods against the client. This will really able to save or avoid unnecessary cost and time. So lastly, thank you for your attention and I hope that my sharing were able to assist you. Thank you, uh, Chong Wei. Uh, thank you for the succinct presentation. Um, now, uh, we still have time left. Uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, uh, pass the mic to Hong Kip to, to, to ask some questions of our special guest today, Chong Wei. Hong Kip, uh, over to you. Uh, hi, Chong Wei. Uh, hi, Chong Wei. Very impressive and informative uh, presentation. Uh, I've been paying close attention uh, to your speech and I have uh, listed down uh, some of my own questions. I'm going to ask you now. Uh, Chong Wei, see, uh, at the beginning of a construction project, uh, the contractor is usually expected to receive a bound contract consisting of letter of acceptance and uh, contract documents, such as condition of contract, BQ, drawing, specification, tender documents. Uh, but however, it is also very often that the contractor is only given the letter of acceptance without <coughs> contract uh, documents, even until the project finishes. Uh, my question is this, is the letter of acceptance a lesser contract uh, than the bound contract? And can you also uh, please perhaps explain to us uh, what the difference between them is? Okay, hey, very good question. So a uh, letter of what says actually is a written confirmation of an award of a contract by employer to successful bidder, right? So setting the amount of the award, the award, the date, of course the date of commencement and completion, and the when the contract which we also notify that the, the contractor when will be the the the, the particular uh, other provisions such as quality acceptation or the any liquid why will be the liquidated damages rate. So it may contain the notice of commencement and all these things. As compared to the it's also also one of the important contract documents, right? However, it compared to the binding contract, it's an agreement in writing between the employer and contractor. So which include contract samples as well, scope and perimeter of the works, as referred to the cost 3.1 of PEM contract that I shared just now. So already listed contract drawings, views of quantities, and any other relevant document, so that to constitute a legal and valid document. So I find that uh, if only relying on the letter of award, sometimes the parties of the contract may, if any inconsistent of documents or any dispute or discrepancy arise, only relying on letter of award is quite difficult to, 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 to resolve there. Uh, it's quite difficult to, to have the consistency in terms of the, both part, the documents between uh, the both, both parties they're holding. So it's still find a good practice to have the complete set of bound contract. Thank okay, you. I see. Mm. Uh, Chong Wei, you also uh, mentioned a letter of intent in your presentation earlier. Uh, as we all know, a letter of intent uh, is only a document expressing an intention to enter into a contract at a future uh, date, but creates no contractual relationship until uh, the future contract has been formalized. Um, however, the reality in Malaysia construction scene is that a letter of intent is often issued uh, for a contractor to urgently start work, while the negotiation between the parties uh, is still ongoing. Uh, what, what if the terms and conditions could not be agreed upon by the parties and the contractor has already incurred substantial amount of money uh, in the project at that point of time? Uh, based on your experience, uh, if you were in the contractor's shoe, uh, what would you do? Firstly, I always not encourage the contractor to kickstart any physical work. Although letter of intent actually is quite a, for a contractor perspective, actually the employer intention to award, but still it's a future tense, right? So 
then sometimes in view of the on the site urgency of the site the progress so then the employer will for me as a contractor i will check through the the content of the LOI of course some nowadays the LOI can be from two pages to 20 pages right as equivalent to LOA but still it's the LOI so then as a contractor position sometimes is to maintain the, the the business relationship sometimes you carry out but usually the letter of intent is only ask the contractor the successful bidder to start preliminary works so if the contractor decided to carry out the physical work then if upon the verbal instruction or whatever i i will encourage the contractor to notify the contract the, the, the employer so while negotiating the, the terms and condition so sometimes let's say just based on your scenario the contractor has completed quite a substantial physical work then the event so while this discussing the terms and condition is also timely notify the client what will be the percent physical work percentage completed uh, progressively so at least let the the opportunity for the client to aware what is happening on the site and how much cost already how much cost already incurred as while waiting while while the both parties are discussing so then notify the client uh, within a reasonable time if let's say just now as you say that what if the position both party cannot agree then what the contractor can can will be go for next step so i will i will also sim similarly con notif encourage the contractor to notify the con uh, the client side so since both party unable to proceed further then also seek compensation based on whatever uh, actual physical work done carry out on site with all the proper record verified by both parties or joint inspection in my answer yeah, thank you jungwei uh, uh, maybe we also want to have uh, wailun's uh, view on this uh, question wailun um, okay i'm i'm looking from a legal perspective and this is not an uncommon uh, scenario where contractors after signing the letter of intent has actually proceeded with the works on site only uh, when they get deeper into the works they realize that there were a lot of uh, uh, negotiations still cannot be resolved uh, on the terms and they could not actually uh, enter into a certain uh, contract documents now what happened is that at that point in time they are only left with a document that is the letter of intent now as a lawyer i would actually first look at the contents of the letter of intent first because nowadays and uh, the documents has actually evolved over the time compared to about 15 years or 20 years ago when in those times when people talk about letter of intent it is really a letter of intent to uh, to give you to, to notify you my intention to employ you but it's not strictly a formalized contract yet and it has got no uh, contractual uh, significance or implication but nowadays uh, even though sometimes the letter of intent is titled as letter of intent when you look at the con contents of the documents which may go into like chongwei said 20 pages long and set out very clearly what are the rights and the obligations of the parties then you don't look at the title anymore you look at the contents of the letter of intent to see whether in actual fact it constitutes a true letter of award if it does then they are legal decisions to say that even though it is titled as letter intent but the substance is synonymous to a letter of award and therefore it still could constitute a contract with that then you have a written contract now what happened is that if the letter of intent is in the true sense of a letter of intent meaning to say that the contents are really really simple just an indication of an intention to employ you but you have nevertheless started the works meaning and uh, when you get deeper into the works, there is actually no contract signed. Meaning to say that you have actually agreed to proceed with the works without a contract in hand. Now, what happens then? The common law would actually come in. In a sense that, uh, and the contract side would also come in to say that so long that you do the works with no intention to do it for free, and the other party has actually benefited from your works, the other party will have to compensate the contractor for the works done. Now, at this point in time, I agree with Chong Wei, you will have to have a clear record of what kind of works have been done on site. Now, what kind of compensation that you will be able to get? Now, if there is no contract, the common law comes in, then you will be compensated based on 
reasonable sum. And what is reasonable sum? It would depend on what is the market rate and what is the market condition at the time when you carried out the works. And what is the actual cost that you have incurred in carrying out the works. Now, that would be very messy. First of all, if there is no con uh, written contract, you're already out of a SIPA regime. Even though you have a claim, you cannot go for SIPA. And there's no contract, the only avenue that you can actually go and claim against the employer is to go to court. So that's why the good practice, we come back to the title, is to ensure that you have all the uh, contractual documents before you proceed with the works, at least with the letter of award. The nitty gritty about the uh, other documents forming uh, the contract, like the big thick bound contract can come later. All right, uh, Hongkit, over to you. All right, okay. Uh, back to Zhong Wei. Uh, yeah. Zhong Wei, so we all know uh, verbal instruction is very common these days, uh, as you also mentioned in your presentation earlier. Uh, if a contractor is given verbal instruction to perform works on urgent basis, uh, assume the, con uh, the contract does not provide a clear timeline uh, to give the notice, as a matter of good practice, how soon should the contractor give notice to formalize the verbal instruction to safeguard it's a contractual right. Uh, so my 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 take will be depends on the situation. As you mentioned, urgent basis, then sure will be really involved the, the site coordination or site constraint issue. Then I, I find that it's good to confirm the instruction as soon as possible, or within the reasonable time. I find the reasonable time will be around one or two days because nowadays the technology is also I mean that usually site the 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 sizable project will have a site office. So the, the contractor team actually can immediately after receive the instruction to formalize it and write to the respective consultants. So alternatively, also can uh, record it into the site diary on the site diary, so which is also a good record keeping because the site diary is a very important document there to record what will be the activities or event happen during that particular day. Now, can I add something, Hongkit, uh, to yeah. Chong Wei's answer? Now, sure. again, I'm giving a legal perspective. Now, the good practice is always when this scenario happens, which is, which is also quite common in Malaysia, is to always go back to the contract. Now, assuming that you uh, apply PAM contract, I, if I'm not mistaken, Clause 4 has actually stipulated that if an oral instruction is given on site for you to do certain works, you as a contractor, will have to confirm it in writing if the architect does not issue or follow up with a written architect's instruction. And there's also a timeline within which you have to confirm it. If you don't confirm it, then you are actually put yourself in a very muddy and unclear position later if you want to claim for the work done. So as a matter of good practice, go back to contract know what is the timeline within which the contractor will have to send in the CAI or the contractor's uh, architect's instruction confirmation. So then uh, everything will be made clear promptly and not to wait until the end of the project and argue about this variation works during the final account stage. Now, back to you, Hong Kit. Okay, thank you, Wailun. Uh, Chong Wei, uh, yep. another very often uh, situation encountered by a contractor uh, if a contractor has made its uh, extension of time application strictly in accordance with the procedural requirements uh, stated under the contract, in other words, uh, according to your good practice, but the architect does not respond, uh, can you please share with the audience uh, your, your advice on this? So, of course, according to the plan contract, after the contractor or subcontractor fulfill all the, the, the procedure, then the, the architect will based on the cost put 23 for main contract, architect will require to assess or review within the time frame, say uh, within the six week period, or ask for further documentation. So in the event as your scenario where the architect didn't fulfill his duty under the contract, so this might have tendency that employer may breach the contract, then employer also may lose his right to impose the LD. Okay. It's on my side. Uh, or why don't you have additional uh, no, I, I don't, I don't uh, wish to because it's a, it, again, it's a common uh, scenario. It would uh, give rise to many, many uh, variables depending on the, on the circumstances of each case as well. Yeah. Uh, Chung Wei, so, uh, I, have the, I have the 
PAM contract 2018 uh, in front of me now, uh, we all know you are familiar with the uh, this version of contract. So under clause uh, 23.1a uh, of PAM contract 2018, the contractor is required to give notice for its, for its intention to claim extension of time within 28 days uh, from the date of uh, architect instruction or the confirmation architect instruction or the commencements of the relevant event. So uh, if the contractor on his own fault only realizes the event on the 29th day, uh, my question is this, should the contractor give up applying for extension of time? If I, if, uh, of course, based on contract is contract, like, as Wylon always mentioning, right? So then 28 days is the timeline. However, it's based on your scenario, 29 days actually already assisted one day. I think actually quite a good practice compared, I mean based on the, the, the reality, quite a good practice actually for based on the current existing site progress right, uh, condition. However, of course, you, the contractor based on contract practice already missed the, missed the timeline. I will still advise the contractor to submit this particular EOT relevant event because why? Usually for construction project, not only one delay event, they will have more relevant event day after. So then at least learn the lesson. So, so the contractor will continue to have a very good uh, monitor and control on the, on the uh, time on this particular EOT practice and procedure to in a way to mitigate this particular risk for not complying to that particular 28 days timeline. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Wailun, I have no further question uh, for Chong Wei. I see. Okay. I think uh, we have uh, you know, uh, overrun the session by seven minutes. Uh, perhaps we can pass it back to Chong Wei to see whether he has any uh, concluding remark uh, to make to, uh, for the audience. Uh, Chong Wei? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, but before, before my concluding remark, right? So I can see both of you have been enjoying questioning me. So before, before closing, I have some questions for the host to answer. Because my, I think some of my friends also here. So when my friends know I'm attending this particular session, right? I have received many requests to ask some questions because you two will have no time to answer usually. Right? Answer all the questions. So first, I have a question to, for the host, right? Pursuers to the cross 22.1, I'm contract 26. If the contractor fails to complete the works by the completion date, the architect shall issue a certificate of non-completion. But the scenario like this, if the, if the project completed about one year, then no ECNC issued by the architect, then the contractor still did not receive any pay, payment due from the employer and decided to take SIPA action and serve the payment claim to the employer. Day after the contractor received CNC from the employer or architect, day after, right? So will this CNC will still carry weight or this practice is appropriate. Now, uh, <laughs> this is also quite common. Uh, you know, uh, I think three of us have been involved in uh, being the representative or the advisor to respective uh, parties in a SIPA proceedings, be it employer, contractor, or subcontractors. Now, this scenario uh, I have also encountered before. The thing is that uh, we have to look at the contract. Now, there are two things about it. First, I would say contractually and legally, the architect has the power still to issue the CNC uh, late. Uh, so long the, the architect has not issued the final certificate because the final certificate marks the end of the role as an architect under the contract. And once the final certificate is issued under the law, the architect is deemed to be functus official. But before that, he still have the residual powers or the powers even after the completion of the works to issue the relevant certificates even though belatedly. As you understand, uh, PEM form, there is no timeline imposed upon the architect to issue the CNC after the contractor has uh, failed to complete the works by the contractual or the extended day. Now, having said that, the second issue is credibility. Now, because... Uh, I think it applies to both a uh, belated uh, EOT certificate or the belated uh, CNC. Both scenarios are the same. If you issue these uh, certificates late, it would actually cast a lot of doubts in so far as the credibility is concerned. And if the architect doesn't have a good reason to explain the delay, most of the time, 
the credibility of these uh, certificates will become very much diminished. And the tribunal actually can, for very good reason, uh, reject uh, the CNC and uh, uh, disallow the LD to be imposed upon the contractor. Now, as I said, I have divided into two parts. One is actually the legality or the permissibility of issuing belated CNC or certificate of VOT. But at the end of the day, depending on the circumstances of the case, the credibility of these two certificates issued belatedly uh, would be diminished. Thank, thank you, Varun. Okay, right. So my next uh, follow up, next next question will be to the. To I the, think the uh, okay. Chung Wei, the, just do the last question for us because we okay, right. supposed to ask questions. So, only the questions so, the okay, right. <laughs> under under pen contract, just a quick one. If the if the works are pre practically completed, but the architect fails to issue CPC, can the contractor claim for the first two point five retention sum in SIPA? <laughs> Hey, Zhong Wei. Okay, first, uh, congratulations to you. You have just asked all the questions we have prepared for our CPA section on the trial. Uh, so we have no choice but to invite you back here on the trial for another uh, grilling and uh, questioning sessions. Okay, uh, coming back to, to your question, uh, the contractor's contractual entitlement for the release uh, of the first uh, retention sum arises upon the issuance of the CPC. So when the contractor takes a CPA claim against the employer for the first retention sum, 99% uh, of the time, the, contract, uh, the employer would defend the claim on the ground that uh, without CPC, the contractor is not contractually entitled for the first retention sum. However, uh, if the CPC is uh, wrongly denied or withheld, the adjudicator is empowered under uh, Section 25N of CPA Act uh, to decide or declare the release of the retention sum, notwithstanding no CPC has been issued. So uh, the key point here is whether the contractor can prove to the adjudicator that the CPC has been wrongfully withheld. Uh, this very much uh, ties back with your presentation today. Uh, the contractor's documentation, do documentation must be in place. Uh, for example, site diaries, uh, site photo, correspondence, uh, the exchange between the parties can all be used to prove the works uh, have already achieved practical completion. So if the contractor can't prove the practical completion uh, on paper, the practical completion remains uh, in his mind, uh, which the adjudicator cannot tap in, uh, into, unless the adjudicator names is uh, Professor X. Uh. So most likely the contractor's CPA claim will fail. All right. That's my, my question, uh, that's my answer for your question. Thank you, thank you. I think I better uh, conclude my, the, uh, to conclude this presentation. Yeah, with, yeah with that's the, right. I would Please. like to thank Hong Kit and Violun for inviting me to join this interesting l 2 construction series. Yes, indeed, which is a very good sharing platform to create awareness and knowledge sharing to the stakeholder of construction industry, especially during this particular MCO period. So well done. And also thank to the participants uh, who support the, to, today's session, especially in, actually I find that I also noticed that quite a good response, although it's a Sunday morning. Lastly, stay safe and stay healthy at home. Thank you and bye. Uh, thank you, Chung Wei, uh, for answering uh, our questions. Uh, also, thank you all the audience for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed and benefited from the sharing today. Uh, as I said yesterday, we will address uh, unanswered questions at our Q&A only section on the, the team. So, our, our guest for tomorrow's session is uh, Mr. San, uh, Nicholas Sunderland from Manchester, who is a diehard Manchester City fan. He is hoping this uh, EPL season will be cancelled for obvious reason. Uh, the topic is construction management when East meets West. And uh, Mr. Sunderland promises us uh, he will be L2 construction series Roy Keane tomorrow morning. Okay, see you tomorrow. All right, thank you, uh, and thank you, Hongkit, and thank you all the audience who have uh, taken the time to participate in this L2 series session. Stay home and stay safe. Thank you very much. I'll see you all tomorrow again. Thank you very much. Bye.